Hello and welcome everyone to my third Jungian analysis of the Zerg. This video will be about Griffith, about his persona and which archetypes he represents in the story. After that I will talk about the overall philosophy of the Zerg, and that part I'm gonna bring in some Nietzsche. Jung was strongly influenced by Nietzsche so I think that fits. Now again, this video will go deeper into the psychology of Berserk, so if you want to understand this video, I do recommend you watch the two previous ones, links are in the description. I've also made a video about the psychology of Boku no Hero, if that is your thing, about the nature and nurture of evil, so if you like, you can go and check it out, link is also in the description. This video will contain material from the manga, so if you're an anime only, beware, because I will be spoiling you and some of the material is very much not safe for work. Now, let's get started. While many can pursue their dreams in solitude, other dreams are like great storms, blowing hundreds, even thousands of dreams apart in their wake. Dreams breath life into men, and can cage them in suffering. Men live and die by their dreams, but long after they've been abandoned, they still smolder deep in men's hearts. Some see nothing more than life and death. They are dead, for they have no dreams. This is said by Griffith, who when we first meet him in the story, already has a fully developed persona of the unbeatable and unfallible mercenary captain of the Band of the Falcon. Griffith, the Falcon of Light. Falcons are a symbol for vision, freedom, and victory. They also stand for salvation to those who are in bondage, whether moral, emotional, or spiritual. With Jung, birds stand for the conscious, for the masculine, for enlightenment, but also for war. All of this fits Griffith perfectly. Wildly ambitious, methodical, Wanting to have wings, to be free, to soar through the sky. But as we have seen in my previous videos, identifying too strongly with a persona can lead to it overpowering us. This is what happened to Griffith, when gods bested him in combat. In Griffith this leads him to a state of enantiodromia, a phenomenon which occurs when a one-sided tendency dominates conscious life. In time, an equally powerful counterposition is built up, which first inhibits the conscious performance, and then breaks through conscious control. In Antiodromia led Griffith to a very difficult position, almost costing him everything. He is reborn though with Femto. Femto has the shape of a bat, and that is also very fitting. To some, bats represent a psycho pump messengers and carriers of information from the deep unconscious. They are night flyers, living in caves in the shadow. Caves, according to Jung, are a symbol for the unconscious, and bats can see and travel freely through the shadow. I think Femto is Griffith's shadow. Femto, in my mind, stands for Griffith's naked want. Strip away all the lofty speeches, all that is left is his pure need. A need for others, a need to be worshipped, to be praised, to be challenged. It is very telling that the first thing he did after he became Femto was to rape Casca. Not because he wanted her sexually, but because gods had taken her away from him. Femto represents that what is in Griffith's unconscious, his need for others, his irrational jealousy. The bat also looks like the representation of the devil. And while the idea of Griffith as the devil has some merit, to say that he is the Antichrist or the personification of evil in Berserk is far too simple. Let's shelve that for now and let's take a look at Griffith as he is now, as the King of Falconia. Griffith, after fierce fighting with the Kushan Empire, has carved out a kingdom for himself, Falconia. Let's take a look at the archetypes he has in him as a king. The first one is, of course, the ruler archetype. The ruler's motto is, power isn't everything, it is the only thing. The ruler's quest is to create order and structure, and enhance an effective society in which the subjects of the ruler can live productive and relatively happy lives. His core desire is control. 
his greatest fear is being overthrown. This fear can lead him to becoming the tyrant king, insisting on his own way and banishing creative elements from the kingdom or the psyche to gain control at any price. Griffith certainly has got elements of the ruler in him. We haven't seen the tyrant in him yet, but considering how petty and jealous he can be, it is not so far-fetched to think that he has the tyrant in him as well. Griffith as a ruler has got supernatural powers. He can make arrows miss, he can create storms, he can commune with the dead. This last thing puts him in mind of the shaman archetype. The shaman is a guide and a healer who through his connection to the spirit world can heal people. This is seen in Griffith when he allows his subjects to commune with the dead and so get closure. The shaman has gotten his knowledge through hard won experience, through a trauma of some sorts. This is also seen in Griffith. He went through periods of prolonged torture before the eclipse, where he was reborn with new powers. A shadow side of the shaman is the trickster, who is an archetype in and at himself, but also not a side of the shaman. The trickster is the character in myths and lore who brings chaos to an otherwise placid story. In Norse mythology he is Loki, in Africa Kwakunansi, in the west Reinhard the Fox. The trickster is often the catalyst that pushes the storyline along by abruptly shifting the direction, and because of this is frequently the cause of distress. Like the shaman, he can bring us to new insights about ourselves, but the trickster does this through sometimes very cruel means. Tricksters poke holes in rigid boundaries, and complicate situations with multiple points of view. It is the archetype that pushes us to question norms and move beyond known limits. One of the forms of the trickster is that of the devil. Jung saw the devil as not a representation of evil, but as a force that drives us towards individuation. He is the snake that convinces us to eat the apple, and so gives us insight into good and evil. He is Lucifer, the light bringer, who sheds light on our shadow. The devil is a healing myth who fosters our coming into consciousness in both positive and negative ways. It is this coming into consciousness what Griffith does to several characters, several times in the story. First to Casca, when he gives her a sword to defend herself against the rapist. He teaches her that she is not powerless to defend herself. He does it to Guts when Guts overhears him talking about how Griffith doesn't seize the band as friends or equals, but as subordinates. This puts Guts on the path towards individuation. He does it to Guts and Casca both during the eclipse, making them aware of the true darkness in the world and of Griffith's own nature. I'm not saying that what Griffith did during the eclipse was good. His actions are appalling. But Guts, after a long and hard journey, has reached a balance between the beast within and his need for others. I can only hope that Casca, now that she has woken up, can finally shake herself loose from her blind devotion to Griffith, and maybe start living for herself as well. As I said, the insights we get through the trickster are often painful, but can lead to becoming more complete. Griffith does this on a larger scale as well. When the Kushan Emperor is defeated, a rift appears in worlds, bringing our world into contact with the spirit world. The world is suddenly confronted with a realm that they had no idea of, a realm that contains aspects of our imagination, and our shadow even. This is Griffith again as the trickster, trick on the, the Kushan Emperor to be an instrument for the awakening of the world. The symbolism of the Eldritch abomination that was the Emperor transforming into the Tree of Life is very powerful. The tree that stands at the center of Falconia has the Apostles at its roots and so reaches down to the darkness of man, what at the top reaches to heaven remains to be seen. So Griffith represents both the shaman as well as the trickster. But where the shaman is free to soar through the sky due to his connection with the spirits, Griffith cannot fly, despite having wings. I say this because Griffith in my mind is shackled by his belief in causality, and it is here that we'll delve into the philosophy of Berserk.
Causality is the law of cause and effect in the world of berserk. It is a force that influences a person's situation and even emotional states, which are tem tempered through years of careful causal manipulation. Griffith, Void, another member of the Godhand, and even Skull Knight, a mysterious character who helps out guts, all believe that causality decides one's path in life. Griffith believes that causality has destined him to become the king of Falconia, that every step on his path was already preordained. Well, to me that just sounds like Calvinism, but with more steps. According to Calvinists, everything is preordained by God, and fighting or resisting God's plan is futile. Replace causality with God, and you have the exact same thing. Causality wills it, or God wills it. To me, in Berserk, there are now gods and monsters. The Apostles were once human. The God Hand were once human. Even the idea of evil itself comes from us humans. It exists because we needed reasons for cruelty and death. Without us there will be no idea of evil. So there are no gods and monsters, there is just us. We do the evil that we do. No outside force is commanding us. Now the idea does tell Griffith that he is the chosen one. But it also says that it is very human. And if there is one thing that humans are very good at, then it is finding excuses and reasons for our behavior. Because what would you rather believe? That some all-powerful force commanded you to sacrifice everything for your dream? Or that it was you? That you had your comrades thrown apart? That you raped a woman who placed all her faith in you? That you have it in you to betray your best friend like that? And this is why Griffith isn't free. He pretends that he has no emotions. He represses the jealousy that he feels. He denies that he needs others and places the responsibility for evil outside himself. Like Jung said, there is no outside representation of evil, there is just us. And this is very similar to Nietzsche. Nietzsche said, God is dead. Well, that could be seen as pessimistic. It can also be seen as the ultimate freedom. It would mean that there is no Sky Daddy who decides whether you succeed or fail in life. You determine that. Your failures are your own, but your successes as well, as well as the evil that you do. The rejection of otherworldly powers who shape our lives can be seen as an open ocean, which can be both frightening as well as exhilarating. The people who embrace this and who create a new way of living can represent a new stage in human development, the Overman. And there is no one in Berserk who embraces this more than Guts. Guts doesn't believe in fate. He believes in his own flesh and blood, in his own power and will. He doesn't bow down to some higher power. When the Kushan Emperor promises Guts power to help him get revenge on Griffith, Guts answers that he doesn't have time for a pissing contest between monsters, so go bother someone else. This is God's rejecting, though not denying, the otherworldly powers of Berserk. He acknowledges the darkness in the world, but does not let it control his life. God will follow his own path and get revenge on his own terms. He knows and acknowledges his shadow. He uses the beast within constructively. He doesn't lie or make excuses for the evil that he has done, but moves on and accepts help from others. Guts is the Overman, and the closest of individuation of everyone in the story. This was my third video of the Jungian Psychology of Berserk. I hope you liked it. Like if you liked it. Share if you want because that does help my channel out. Subscribe if you want more content. And see you next time.